Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Jim Abraham, and it's my pleasure to co-moderate uh, this session on uh, uh, the BC Extreme Events, the panel discussion. Uh, I had the pleasure of sitting in on most of the previous four scientific sessions on extreme event on the BC Extreme Events, and there was such a nice mix of scientific presentations from the province provincial agencies from the federal government and from academia. Um, so the, I uh, have to thank the uh, scientific program committee for agreeing that uh, consistent with the scientific uh, programs theme, we're going to conclude that series of sessions on the BC extreme events with a panel discussion. And the theme being um, science serving society and so we've got four panelists whose roles are largely public service, serving society. Um, we've got the first panelist will be in alphabetical order, will be Dave Campbell. He's the head of the River Forecast Center in BC. Uh, the next panelist will be Matt Godso. Uh, Matt's the Director of Resilience and Economics uh, in Public Safety Canada. Um, Jason Thistlewhite, who's in transit, but should be joining us shortly. He's a professor at the School of Environment, uh, Enterprise and Development at the University of Waterloo. And Russ White, a uh, good colleague and friend, he's the Director General of Prediction and Services with the Meteorological Service of Canada. Uh, Jen Spinney, who's a professor of um, uh, emergency management at York University, is uh, co-moderating the session with me. And I'd ask, uh, uh, Jen, to say a few words and then introduce yourself. Oh, hi, everyone. Thanks very much, Jim. It's a real pleasure to be here. I'm excited to participate and help Jim lead this session, um, this panel discussion. Um, uh, I was uh, asked by Jim to help out with the session, uh, maybe because of my interest in the human and social dimensions of all kinds of hazards and disasters. Uh, I'm trained as an anthropologist, and like Jim said, I work as an assistant professor at York University in York's Disaster and Emergency Management Program. So these types of hazard discussions, especially learning from stakeholders who are involved in helping to keep people safe, is right in my wheelhouse, and I'm very happy to be here today. Thanks very much, Jim. Thanks a lot, uh, Jen, and uh, thanks again for uh, helping us out on this. And uh, those of you who don't know me, I happen to be the president of the CMOS right now, but I have been interested in extreme events throughout my career. Uh, I spent 36 years with Environment Canada and probably the most notable um, activity was the starting, starting of the Canadian Hurricane Center, as well as launching a research program that involved flying into hurricanes uh, here in Canada. Since retiring about 10 years ago, I've been involved with CAT IQ, which is a insurance based organization focused on catastrophes, but they have a conference every year that I've been on the advisory board for. And that involves really a, a collaboration between the um, uh, insurance industry and other industries, the other private sector industries, the public sector, the academic sector and non-government organizations. And it's a wonderful conference that will be uh, taking place just after uh, CMOS. And uh, anyone who's interested in that, certainly, I, I, especially anyone who's interested in extreme events and catastrophes, I'd welcome them to uh, consider uh, attending CAD IQ. So the session today, as I said, is the, is the culmination of a series of, uh, uh, a series of uh, uh, sessions on uh, the BC extreme events. And really it's just remarkable um, that uh, the increase in, in, in extreme events and the BC extreme events, not only the heat wave being likely the most deadly weather related event in the history of Canada, but the atmospheric river and the subsequent flooding likely to be the most costly weather related event in the history of Canada. And so today we're going to have an opening, um, uh, some opening remarks, uh, up to 10 minutes from each of the four panelists. And then we're going to have an open discussion. We'll likely have 
30 to 40 minutes of time for discussion. So I encourage you to put your thoughts, your questions, or any discussion you'd like to initiate in the chat box. And Jen's gonna mon uh, monitor that as well as myself. And hopefully we'll have a really engaging discussion um, after the, uh, the, uh, uh, the four panelists give their opening remarks. So um, we're gonna start with Dave. Dave Campbell from the River Forecast Center in BC. Great, thank you. And thanks for having me here today to, to chat about some of the experiences from the BC side of, of things. Obviously, I'll probably be, um, my work with the province is, is looking at the river forecasting side of things and issuing flood warnings uh, and that kind of thing. So definitely providing some perspective uh, from the work that's been involved and particularly from experiences that uh, we had during the November atmospheric river events in BC. Um, I had the pleasure of, of briefly working with um, Peter Rasmussen at the, the, the late Peter Rasmussen at the University of Manitoba on a, on a project a few years ago through the Canadian flood net and that was focused on you know doing an evaluation of river forecast and flood forecast centers across across uh, across the country and I remember one thing that that sat with me uh, in our time discussing this and looking at forecasting is the concept that uh, you know in, in a lot of ways to be a forecaster requires having a, a bit of a thick skin there's a lot of pressure and um, scrutiny over how forecasts go. And certainly in the wake of extreme events and disasters, there's always that sort of need in society to understand what went wrong, where was the warning? Um, how, come, how come we weren't you know, told this is coming? Um, you know, whether or not advisories or warnings were out, there's often that kind of need uh, in the aftermath to kind of explain what happened um, and, and sort of Find, find answers. And also this concept that, that you know, for some, you know, if, if the warning was out, that would have averted cat catastrophe in some way. And obviously, as we look at our role uh, and how we uh, provide forecast services, provide warnings, um, you know, the intent is to provide that uh, ability for society to respond in a timely manner and reduce uh, the impacts of these events. But it's, it's you know, very much almost a, a kind of cliche that after the event, we look to you know what went wrong where can we assign blame and that's certainly been my experience in the bc side of things is, is we're very much following in that suit of, of sort of trying to figure out what, what happened and, and trying to find some explanations um i like to look at things and maybe i'll do a, a thought experiment you know when we look at forecasting and trying to understand uh you know what could happen in the future we, we rely on weather forecasts we rely on river forecasts and modeling um and it's really that uncertainty piece comes in and it can be difficult to you know, ascertain from any particular forecast what, what are those results going to be and we'll, we'll talk about that a little more but um, so I use this as a thought experiment and there's, there's a similarity from all of these these are precipitation forecasts 24 hour forecasts for BC uh, and, and the west coast the similarity between all of these is these are separate atmospheric river events these are forecasts for those at about a, a two day lead time um, for six different atmospheric river events that happened throughout 2021. Um, and I like this because it, it sort of tells a story. If we look at, it, at these, you know, can we pick out which one uh, caused flooding uh, in, in through the, the, you know, so that we saw in the extreme uh, event uh, and which ones didn't. And so I'll, when I look at these, you know, there's certainly a lot of similarities. We've got lots of high intensity rainfall forecasted in each of these scenarios. Obviously, some differences in location. Uh, in in the end of the day, five of these did not cause any real impacts at all. Uh, and number one on top left corner, that's the one that uh, led to the the atmospheric river flooding event. So, I use that as sort of a, a way to think about when we look at these forecasts. We still have so much uncertainty in them, and uh, when we're presented with information uh, and try to relay that or interpret it, there's a number of areas where um, that can either stand up and provide uh, informative forecasting, or that can be challenged by the uncertainty that's there. So I think of four key, key areas where this is challenging. One is on that uncertainty piece and the lead time. We find that if there's a balance between um, having a huge amount of uncertainty in, in most of the forecasting and modeling we're doing, and uh, over the expectations of society to, you know, really be right all the time, to be accurate all the time, and to have as much lead time uh, as necessary. 
it can be difficult marrying up those um, those pieces in terms of what lead time is necessary. What do people need to respond? Um, how much certainty do they do they need? Um, we had six storms, for example, in the fall. Are we evacuating communities every time that forecast is 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 in there? Uh, and if uh, you know six you know five out of six times it's not leading to any significant impacts um, how is that going to play into uh, society's response to to things like like that over forecasting um, we talk a lot about the impacts based obviously that's what we want to be doing we want to be able to provide that information to be able to know um, is this rainfall significant is it going to be causing problems uh, are we expecting high stream flows or are we expecting you know the entirety of the transportation network in and out of Vancouver to be isolated and cut off. And can we make that kind of condition uh, and uh, assessment based on you know something like a, a weather forecast or a river forecast? Um, obviously, very complex systems, and we know that there's more than just you know precipitation coming into play. That we're really marrying um, a whole a whole number of processes that are that are coming in. But how can we start to look at things in a more risk based approach? I put the concept a little bit out of uh, systems-based judgment uh, making, or sorry, systems-based or, or judgment-based uh, decision making. How much human human involvement is there uh, in interpreting forecasts and then presenting and relaying that information to uh, end users, society, stakeholders? We know on the the one hand, the system-based approach, you know, provides that solid scientific foundation, provides uh, you know data which we can work to and and, and assess and provides that sort of systematic approach. But we also know that, you know, strictly putting a forecast out, you know, requires or is requiring some level of, of judgment to, you know, what does this, what does this mean? And so there's, a, I think, an interplay between um, that kind of communication piece of, you know, raw model output, raw forecasts, and some level of human intervention and judgment that goes into that. And both of those systems have inherent uh, limitations, inherent challenges, inherent errors, and are open to uh, open to error. And the last thing I think about is is in terms of that forecasting. How good are we at forecasting? How do we um, verify the modeling that we do? Um, you know, it seems that we we look at and 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 can often miss, despite the fact that. Uh, uh, these events end up being, you know, catastrophic in, in sort of hindsight. What is it that can tell us ahead of time that uh, that would help us to predict it? Is it strictly just going off the modeling uh, or, or or other aspects? And I also think of how well are our models doing at not necessarily predicting things in a broad level day to day basis, but really when we look at extreme events uh, and kind of cast catastrophic events. How well are we specifically doing at forecasting those extreme end members on the on the distribution, and um, you know perhaps looking at uh, sort of shifting the way that we interpret and analyze our forecast skill and our uh, through model verification specifically of these these extreme events. Uh, so that's what I've got for just a sort of opening thoughts, and uh, I'll wrap up there. And thanks very much, David. Those are great. Reminds me a lot of the kind of thought process I've gone through my career as a weather forecaster. So I think there's a lot of similarities. And uh, the tough skin one is something that certainly uh, I can attest to. So I'm going to turn it over now to um, uh, Matt. And um, Matt's with uh, Public Safety Canada. Can you guys uh, hear me OK, Jim? Yeah, perfect. And can you see my slides as well? Yes. OK, perfect. So I'll tell you just a little bit very briefly about myself. So I'm the director of the Resilience and Economics Integration Division within Public Safety. So I'm an emergency manager and a social scientist by training. And I thought that my contribution here might be to try to situate the BC events kind of within the broader context of what we've been seeing in the emergency management domain over the last couple of decades. So the first thing that I wanted to say is, you know, the events in BC were one of the biggest disasters in Canadian history in a decade that every two or three years we have the biggest disaster in Canadian history. So it was a fairly predictable march along this upward trend line of increasing frequency and severity of disasters in Canada. And this is something that we've seen increasing on in sort of a nonlinear way. 
where before the mid 1990s, we really didn't see very often disasters that exceeded $500 million in adjusted disaster losses. And then with the Saguenay River flood in 1996 and the Red River flood in 1997 and the ice storm in 1998, we sort of hit a fundamental tipping point in our disaster risk profile. And every year since then, we've had at least one $500 million disaster. Um, starting in the 2010s on average, we've had at least $1 billion disaster on average every year. And it looks like we're into the next step in that trend line beginning in around 2016. So these disasters are um, increasing and, and you can only have the kinds of impacts that we're seeing economically continue to increase for so long before it starts to shift from economic impacts alone to the economic impacts plus increased disaster morbidity and mortality. And when Jim described the heat uh, events of last year, I mean, that's part of what we saw for the first time a real mass casualty event, which is quite infrequent, luckily, in Canada. When we think about those disaster events, I think it's really important to understand how we conceptualize disaster risk. And for us in emergency management and in the social sciences, it really is about the combination of the hazard, yes, but also the intersection of that hazard with a vulnerable community or with vulnerabilities that exceed that community's ability to cope. So when you adopt this kind of perspective, it means that at bottom, all disasters, regardless of the source hazard, are to some extent man-made because it's the vulnerability, it's the choices that we make about where we put people in communities and how we expose them and the structures that they live in to the hazards that actually gives us the risk. And with that framing in mind, we know that we're simultaneously increasing the frequency, severity, and volatility of many hydrometeorological hazards in a way that we just haven't done before. So these are things that you are much more familiar with than I am in terms of the fingerprints of recent climate change and how it differentiates itself from previous changes in the climate. All of which is just to say that since it seems to be human induced processes that are driving climate change, which is altering the frequency, severity and volatility of the hazards, we're in a position to be able to exert some kinds of control on those changes by reducing climate change itself. But perhaps the easier side of the equation to weigh in on is on the exposure and vulnerability side. So this is actually a fairly similar um, slide to the one that Dave just presented. These are the storm tracks of all of the storms from 1850 to 2005 in the southeastern United States. And here again, you can see there are many, many storms there and there's only one Hurricane Katrina. And so that I think reinforces that intersection between the hazard events themselves and the ways in which we construct and perpetuate vulnerability and inequality in communities. And so that really does show us that there's an opportunity for us to be able to influence the ways that hazards interact with communities that can significantly reduce the economic as well as the uh, morbidity and mortality related impacts. One of the things that we've learned the hard way in emergency management that I think may potentially be relevant here is about how we conceptualize our operating environment. So we like to think that everything happens in nice linear straight lines and that all actors within the system um, are reasonable and logical. And if we can just explain things to the right people at the right time, the correct decisions will get made. And when we look at the increasing march along that disaster impact trend line that I mentioned, we started to ask ourselves why we were not being successful in making the kinds of investments and decisions that would buy down disaster risk over time. And what we realized is that we were actually operating in another kind of complex system. And so these are all of the different pieces just at the federal level of policy and legislation related to emergency management and resilience. And when you understand that this is a complex adaptive system, it's a, it's a network, and that all decisions within that network have sort of differential impacts, and that it at bottom, again, is, is just a very complex place and a very um, socially complex operating environment, it changes the nature of the assumptions that we make about how we can actually change things within the environment. And you can imagine that this same kind of network also exists at every other level of government. Each province could make a comparable map. Um, each local government also has an interplay among many sectors and many organizations within their level of government and also across broader society. 
So what we've been trying to push for over the last couple of years, especially since 2015, is more of a whole of society approach to emergency management. It's an approach that emphasizes resilience and increasing the base levels of resilience across Canadian society, um, rather than trying to predict exactly where events are going to happen. Because there is so much uncertainty in the system, we need to focus instead or in addition to um, more targeted interventions just on generally raising the levels of resilience. And so in 2019, federal, provincial and territorial governments um, approved the emergency management strategy for Canada, which serves as our domestic implementation for the United Nations Sendai framework for disaster risk reduction, which was passed in 2015 and is deliver deliberately interreferential with the Paris Agreement and with the Sustainable Development Goals. And so our big priorities are trying to enhance whole of society collaboration and governance in order to strengthen resilience. Um, an essential one for us also is improving our understanding of disaster risks, which includes both the hazard side as well as the social side. Increasing our focus on whole of society disaster prevention and mitigation activities. So things that we can do well in advance of disasters happening or even in there being a uh, a chance of a disaster coming to a community that allow us to adapt and buy down that risk. Enhancing disaster response capacity and also developing new capabilities to deal with emergency and disaster events as they're occurring. And then finally, just strengthening our recovery efforts and attempting to build back better in order to minimize future disaster events. I think that we can see many of these pieces at play both right now in the months after the events in British Columbia but I also hope that it helps us to frame out a little bit more how we think through um, what future steps that we can take to, to buy down risk and increase resilience for future catastrophic scale events, which are almost certainly coming and probably not too far into the future. So with that, perhaps I can turn it back to you, Jim. Thanks very much, uh, Matt. Uh, uh, <laughs> I love that map of, uh, of all of the uh, kind of a spider web. Imagine the the map of maps, how complex that becomes. It's kind of an ensemble of ensembles. Um, in any case, uh, uh, a lot of really good points. Um, and I'd like to welcome um, your colleague, Jason Thistlethwaite. Uh, I understand you and Jason were meeting this morning and Jason has arrived somewhere, but he certainly has arrived um, at the, on the panel. Uh, Jason's the professor of the School of Environment and Enterprise and development at the University of Waterloo. And uh, I've uh, gotten to know Jason uh, and Matt through CAD IQ. And uh, I'd like to welcome Jason. Oh, he's in an automobile. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> so Jason, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Uh, thanks, Jim. How, how am I sounding? Am I coming through okay? Yeah, actually you're going coming through pretty good. Oh, well, um, good test of our local uh, 5G network here. And uh, water the region. I'm just a little bit south of, of my final stop now, so hopefully I get some better connection once I get back home. Um, but but thanks for the opportunity to speak today. And, and really, this uh, me speaking here is, is actually a bit of a natural extension of, of what uh, Matt was was talking about. So I'll give a little background on how our research team has approached uh, some of the issues around um, the BC case, the flooding in British Columbia, but also uh, some of the research that Matt's been talking about. Um, I'm an associate professor in the School of Environment, Enterprise and Development at the University of Waterloo. And I co-lead I, I co -lead a team uh, that researches how we manage climate change risk in Canada. So from our perspective, the BC floods are sadly more of the same of what we've been experiencing over the last uh, 20, 30 years in Canada. And our major puzzle uh, from the perspective of uh, British Columbia, but also our hazards is how do we implement the strategies we need to be able to reduce our exposure uh, to these hazards? And to, to answer that question, we looked to our European colleagues who in 2007 issued a directive at the European Union level seeking to implement a new approach to managing these hazards, focusing on what Matt's talking about, the whole of society approach that uh, the risk-driven targeted uh, investment in resiliency. But what we found uh, it, from the European experience and a lesson that, that we're learning in Canada is that you can't implement this risk-based approach to management 
if you haven't figured out how it aligns with our existing institutions, practices, culture, actors, and interests. And as Matt demonstrated with his network analysis there, it's fairly messy in Canada. I mean, we arguably have 10 different democracies operating provincially, three territories, federal government, local governments. Uh, it's a messy picture. So we've been looking at who should be doing what, what they ought to be doing, and what resources do they need in the context of um, governing our exposure, uh, risk management in Canada. BC is a good case study because BC, like many other levels of government in Canada, have for the most part delegated responsibility for flood risk management, hazard management down to the municipal level. Our research and discussing with municipalities, um, and, and BC isn't alone, this has quietly been happening across the country. And, in, and indeed, uh, another example would be that we now have overlay and flood insurance, meaning that in many jurisdictions, people no longer qualify for disaster assistance in the event of a flood. So we can see here a, more of a delegation of the financial liability associated with some of this risk away from government and towards individuals. So Matt argued that we need a whole society approach. Our research agrees with that, but that, that, that some sectors of society should be more responsible than others. What we've observed, uh, particularly among municipalities, is a bit of a struggle because of a lack of capacity and resources to be able to manage that responsibility of being on the front lines of climate change risk. There are significant constraints on what local governments can do in the context of what you see in some of the more devastated places in British Columbia. A lot of the land that was developed in the floodplain is lucrative. It, it's a generation of property taxes. This is what municipalities rely on to generate revenue at that level. So there's incentives for local governments and, and even provinces to promote development in these high risk areas due to the, the economic return. Um, as a result of, of sort of this gap of resources, expertise and, and capacity at the local level, and I should qualify this, don't get me wrong, municipalities in Canada are doing fantastic work on climate change. And in fact, they're leading it because they're very much the closest to uh, the factors that are, that are happening on the ground. But their good ideas, their, their strategies, their adaptation, their resilience plans, they need resources and they need capacity. And it's for this reason that one of the conclusion, emerging conclusions out of our research is we'd like to see the upper tier governments, particularly the federal government, take on more of a role in emergency management and uh, um, promoting resilience. So when it comes to asking this question about or, or how we're going to shift towards a whole society approach, we still very much firmly believe that a good chunk of that a contribution should be coming from our senior levels of government who have the resources and capacity to be able to manage this risk. So what would this look like in the context of, let's say, the British Columbia flood? Well, for one, we would arm local governments with much more knowledge uh, about where the risk is so that they could be able to inform or tell residents that you live in a high risk area in all likelihood at some point during the lifetime of your mortgage, you are going to experience a flood. You know, people think that living in a one in 100 year flood zone means that if you have a flood last year, You've got 99 years until the next one. When in fact, what it largely means is you have about a 25% chance of a flood happening across the lifetime of your 30 uh, year mortgage. So we give people information to be able to better understand where the risks are, and then we can prioritize resources to be able to manage um, those risks. The second thing about giving them those resources is we'd like to see the federal government play more of a comparative role to what exists in the United States, where um, in Canada, we have this tradition, this convention of sort of splitting resources, you know, three ways between municipalities, provinces, and the federal government. In other jurisdictions, particularly our G7 counterparts, we see the federal government play a much more significant role in contributing those resources. So whereas we have a 40% cap on the federal contribution through programs like the Disaster Mitigation and Adaptation Fund in Canada, in the United States, it's about 75%, a much higher uh, threshold. And finally, we'd like to see some more coordination on the part of the federal government leading uh, to, to something along the lines of a more independent authority around emergency management and disaster risk reduction in Canada. This exists in other countries in the form of an organization like FEMA, um, but it, it exists elsewhere as well. We'd like to see, you know, if municipalities are in trouble, local governments are in trouble in British Columbia, um, those resources don't require a complicated request via the media or other means to the provincial or federal government for help, but it's already getting, it's already built up. It's been forecast. We know that there's likely to be a flood there. We can get those um, boots on the ground to be able to help in the emergency response. Um, with that, I'll, I'll leave my comments there and uh, be available for questions during uh, the panel.
That was wonderful, Jason. And that was amazing. You, you'd be able to uh, share that really well articulated perspective. Uh, I don't know if you're in a car or uh, in a taxi, but uh, that was very well done. Congratulations. And I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Russ White. Russ is the Director General of Prediction and Services uh, with uh, Environment and Climate, Climate Change Canada with the Meteorological Service of Canada. And uh, thank you for being with us, Russ. Turn it over to you. My pleasure, Jim. Can you hear me okay? Perfect. <clears throat> okay, so uh, very happy to see uh, this attention from CMOS to these, uh, to these events. Uh, very, very significant events. Won't go into the details about those. I know we've had some, we've had some sessions during the week with some, some expert views on that. But just to say, when we, when we look at these events, um, when we look at from the perspective of the heat dome, to see a temperature like 49.6 recorded in Canada, to see almost 600 deaths attributed to a meteorological event. I think that really falls into that category of, of unprecedented. Likewise, on the flooding aspect, obviously we've seen severe flooding in Canada many, many times, but in, in terms of the impacts, as, as Dave mentioned, seeing the lower mainland um, completely isolated, the, uh, the, the loss of life, the loss of livestock, the, uh, the economic impacts, you essentially had gas rationing in the, in the lower mainland. So these, these are really, really significant events. So <clears throat> we're seeing um, what the scientific community has been predicting, the increasing frequency and magnitude of extreme events. And you know, the question here is, well, what does this mean for us as a meteorological service agency? We don't have a, a direct mandate for climate change. Our role is to provide Canadians and their institutions with the information uh, that allows them to sort of make risk-based decisions to, to protect their interests. I think generally folks are aware of our forecasting sort of products to the, uh, to the public, perhaps less aware how active and engaged we are in that uh, public, that coalition that serves emergency management in Canada. And it was interesting to see those, you know, those, those Matt presented there with the complexity around that relationship. We certainly see that that coalition uh, evolves and changes depending on the size of the event, depending on the type of the event. And it's a significant draw on our resources to be able to meet that demand of these large events that exceed the resources of a single location. We have to draw on our, on our resources across our organization more broadly. So <clears throat> what do we learn from these? Um, I think the first thing I want to say is that you know, staff are fantastic. We have really a talented, talented group of people who are dedicated and, and really step up uh, when these things happen. Um, we are very much committed to this idea of, of analyzing our performance and seeking where we can enhance our performance and learning from these events. And you know, we're actively developing a strategy where we're pre-preparing plans of how we respond to these significant events because you have to be implementing plans when you're responding. You can't be start, start planning. So we're very much in that mode. But in terms of what we learned from these two events, there's two things I'll point to um, sort of initially. Um, the first one is this notion of early, of early notification, this idea of, of coming up with information. And, and there was a few references amongst the panelists of of the importance of, of the lead time. Um, I think in the meteorology community, we're often, we're balancing between uh, not wanting to be wrong and wanting to come out with information on time. And I think what we've learned from this event and others is we have to build an understanding of what the lead time required by the responding agencies is. So if we're talking about a, a hard frost in a city and the, and the need to communicate with the municipality so they can plan their road operations, Maybe we're talking a day, maybe even less. Uh, when we're talking about a significant hurricane coming up the, uh, the East Coast and we're speaking with um, hydro companies about you know, pre-positioning their crews to deal with these trees that we're forecasting to come down based on the wind, you know, that's a few days. When we're talking about an event on the magnitude of the heat dome and you look at the response from the, from the public agencies that include Things like organizing extra shelters for the homeless, setting up cooling stations, setting up spray stations on streets. And you look at the time frame that's required, we have to be prepared to come to them with the information that we have at that time, which is perhaps prior to that point where we feel completely comfortable that the models are converging on a solution, the uncertainty is, is decreasing. 
we have to we have to come to give them that lead time and say this is what we know right now this is what the potential impacts are this is what we don't know and this is how this information is going to become more precise as we get closer to the event um, i think there's some good examples uh, you know dave had some interesting shots of various atmospheric rivers this notion of, uh, of understanding the antecedent conditions, seeing this significant event propagating across the Pacific, and perhaps not being able to say exactly where it's going to hit the coast, but be able to talk about what those potential impacts are and refine these details. So this, this aspect of early notification and embracing the communication of uncertainty and probabilistic forecasting to, to give the public response agencies adequate time to response is, is certainly something that we need to embrace. Um, the other thing is risk communication. This is really the business we're in. We're in the business of providing people with meteorological information that allows them to mitigate their risks. So timeliness and accuracy of meteorological information is and always will be important. But we have to add the notion of the effectiveness of forecast information. Is it understandable? Is it actionable? And this is where the notion of the shift towards impact-based forecasting comes in, not just talking about the amount of precipitation we expect or the strength of the wind, but what impacts are associated with those associations. We've seen various events around the world. I think the most prominent one recently was probably that event in, in, in Germany where a hydrometeorological event was well forecast, but didn't perhaps provoke the responses that would have, would have been necessary uh, in society. The heat, uh, the heat dome is a, is a very interesting case. And Jim, you raised the question about how you communicate about something which is genuinely unprecedented. Um, our messaging uh, around that event was, this is a long and dangerous heat wave. And that is a, that is a strong and significant message receiving that message would one associate that with the outcome which is an extraordinary impact in terms of the uh, the number of lives lost so there's there's clearly work to do <clears throat> there in the future in terms of going forward for us i think there's a you know there's a, there's a couple of aspects to this there's, there's an internal aspect and there's kind of an external aspect we need very much to focus our resources towards these kind of events we need to take a risk-based approach where our, our efforts and the mobilization of our resources is commensurate uh, with the risk that's posed to society. We're increasingly looking at the improvements in numerical weather prediction system and, and leveraging those systems where they can produce products that are fit for service and allows us to focus that precious expertise of meteorologists on these critical events. Whereas, as Dave was referring to, that integration of the understanding of the model with the local effects, with the, with the history of the antecedent conditions and the, um, you know, the effects we have in terms of an impact basis, this is where we really need to focus our efforts. We need to shift very much towards this idea of uh, <clears throat> an impact-based decision support system, which doesn't just speak about the, the, the numerical quantities of different weather elements, but really talks more profoundly um, about those impacts. We see these as, you know, we're looking for these measures of set success in terms of the, uh, you know, when we think we've got it right. And there's, there's a few pictures we've used before with things like hydro, hydro crews pre-positioned because we're forecasting windstorms. In the context of, of these significant events that we've seen, it's that close engagement with those public authorities. And then also during the event, there's a significant requirement of us to support the response activities even after the events have occurred. So I'll stop there, Jim, and, uh, and, and save the rest for the questions that I think we can see coming. Thanks very much, Russ. That was excellent. And I'm going to turn it over to Jen, who's going to manage some of these brief questions. <laughs> well, sure. Yeah, there, we've had a couple very good questions or thoughts, at least, posed in the, um, in the chat. Um, I'll give Mindy uh, the, the option to express the question uh, you know, verbally to the group if they so choose. Would you like to do that, Mindy, or would you like me to, to um, vocalize your message or your question? Oh, I'd be fine that you vocalize it. I don't know which of my questions you're reading. <laughs> well, I'm, read I'm reading the first one. I'm going in order here. So we'll just start uh, at the beginning. Mindy uh, made a comment. If the event, uh, and would you say that this is addressed to everyone? Mindy? Like to all of the panelists, I mean? Sure. 
Okay, excellent. If the event in November 1415 had lasted more than two days, out to three days to a week, the scale of the catastrophe uh, they feel would be almost unimaginable. We need to be ready for these events and forecast them reliably, and they may never have uh, occurred. There is a great pushback on not forecasting beyond what we have experienced before. The idea being, I think, it's too severe to comprehend. So how can we embrace the science realities and better include what we expect will occur instead of only what has happened in the past? That's a really great question and, and really brings to, to, or brings to bear the notion of how, how far do experts speak beyond um, the science, really? Would any of the panelists like to go ahead and take on that question? I could try to start. Um, yeah, and I, I, I agree. And I think that's one of the challenges that we do see in, in that forecast side of things. And maybe, you know, is, is one of these strong lessons learned um, having gone through events in, in the past year is putting that lens on to the interpretation side of a forecast. Um, and I agree. I mean, I, th I think that's something that has been challenged in the past and, you know, may have played a role in terms of the degree of warning that came out in, in the atmospheric river event, for example, is that sense of seeing, you know, significant rainfall, significant uh, storm coming, but having experienced similar forecasts that um, there isn't always that uh, default to move to the awareness that, you know, this, this, this one is going to be the one that really is, is, is massive. We've got uh, in our work that we do at the River Forecast uh, Center, you know, we, we do look at a lot at historical data, historical trends, historical conditions, and help use those to guide our understanding of um, how severe this, you know, impending forecast might be in, in relation to those conditions. And I think there is room, and I think that is something that we need to be doing is um, starting to understand that when we, we have the potential for things uh, in the forecast that are you know outside of that realm that outside of the realm of experience outside of the realm of of, of sort of that historical statistical range that um we we need to act on it and i think that's that's i see as a as a lesson uh from these events is is really taking that back and realizing that uh you know more precautionary principle and particularly when we're identifying those kind of outside the realm of 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 what has happened in the past that we need to, to take note of that and, and use that to, to ramp up uh, our, our communication. Thanks for that, Dave. I, I see this as being a risky, a risky move, though, uh, to better include what we expect will occur, particularly for those types of events that haven't happened. And how do we how do we convey what we expect to occur uh, at the risk of being incorrect and then damaging the credibility of um, forecasters. I think it's already a profession that's wrought with uh, assumptions and stereotypes. Um, so not to say I'm against or in disagreement with you, but I do feel like it's a risky move. Matt, um, Russ, Jason, do either of you or any of you have some comments you'd like to add? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to make some comments if I if I could. I think you know Mindy's Mindy's putting her finger on uh, on an important issue. Um, you know, when we think about disaster risk reduction and that sort of classic model of disaster risk reduction with your your risk identification, your preparedness, your response, your sort of build back better. I want to sort of <clears throat> focus a little bit on that risk identification and the importance of climate monitoring, but also the climate model monitoring that supports climate modeling, climate analysis, that allows us from the scientific community to get some notions of the envelope of possibilities in terms of the, the end members of, of these events. Uh, and we need to support these, uh, support these activities that are difficult and, and expensive to, to maintain. The other thing is the, um, you know, the shift towards um, probabilistic forecasting and the use of, of, of ensemble models. So, so these, are, these are coming increasingly coming online and they're, they're essential and they sort of, they, they form the basis of that sort of probabilistic based forecasting, but it's also 
something that we need to work on in terms of how we utilize that information. So sometimes there's a tendency to, you know, look at the, the range of the model solutions and look for that convergence around a central tendency. We also need to communicate this notion of what are the extremities. And this is where we get to this notion of communicating uncertainty um, to decision makers. And we have different audiences in Canadian society. We would communicate, for example, with Dave's group as, as a float forecast forecasting agency, perhaps somewhat differently with the with the Canadian public in terms of being able to discuss, well, here's, you know, here's the end member, here's, here's our expectation, but here's the range of possibilities, here's the uncertainties associated with those, un, uh, with those unlikely events, but the possibilities are there. So this is the modality that we have to get into. I think the notion of a probabilistic forecasting is, is the kind of the pathway through what you speak about in terms of the, you know, the fear of the fear of being wrong, the fear of overwarning. I think if we think differently about how we communicate uh, probability, I think that's that's probably our most effective path forward. That's interesting. Thanks for that, Russ. Um, you talk about disaster risk reduction and and incorporate communication as a as a means or as a, a method towards reducing disaster risk ultimately uh, i would probably I, I see that as a as a key component but i think and possibly in agreement more with how jason and matt approach their research i'm um, looking more at the structural dimensions how can we reduce our vulnerabilities the the ability for people to be exposed to such hazards that then create all of the disasters. Um, so I'm wondering, Matt or Jason, do either of you have comments in response to Mindy's, um, you know, perspective and question? I mean, maybe one interesting view, and I don't know that it directly addresses her question, but if we look at the decision makers who are involved on the emergency management side, they're presented with incredibly detailed information on the probabilities and on the uncertainties from the natural hazards community. And I think that the ways in which that is communicated, which is very precise, also prevents them from taking more aggressive action because the counterfactual for them is like the national security community who doesn't deal in anywhere near the same level of accuracy with probabilities and with um, actually communicating the levels of uncertainty. And they're they're much more successful in, in getting decision makers to take on action. And you know there are psychological reasons for that as well. Um, I remember I think it was an Onion article that said that if Al Qaeda was causing climate change, we would have solved it a long time ago. Because if you can assign a certain person to the cause and it's a threat and the other, then it's a lot easier to mobilize um, political incentives. But all of which is to say, a I think that figuring out how to communicate effectively and figuring out our own internal levels of risk tolerance for how much we're willing to push the envelope to make something clear and actionable for decision makers is worth reflecting on. And I think to date, we've largely been hedging on the side of precision over the outcomes that we want. And I'm sure that there's a lively conversation there about the ethics of either side of that equation, but it's a conversation worth having. And then also just to pick up on your point, Jennifer, I mean, I'm, I'm strongly biased on the side of dealing with uncertainty, not by communicating, about it, but by hedging against it in de development of communities and in approaches of, of developing capabilities. Like if you don't know the answer, just assume that the answer is bad and then develop the capabilities to be able to deal with that. And there are ways that you can overlay those probabilistic risk assessments with more deterministic and scenario-based assessments. And you look at the capabilities required to deal with them and you can start to figure out which capabilities apply to the most scenarios and in that way deal with some uncertainty. Um, but again, I think that falls more to the emergency management side. And just to, to be clear, those global ensemble probabilistic models, and we're using them on the flood side now, I think they're a huge leap forward in terms of coverage across the country. Um, so for us, they've been really super useful and, and we look forward to better refinement of those kinds of models. Thanks for that, Matt. You bring up this uh, this uh, focus on integration and coordination across stakeholders, across uh, expert types of knowledge, uh, and just how important that is for addressing these really wild, complex problems that we are uh, contending with. Jason, I don't know if you have um, if you're still in en route or if you. Oh wait, no, you're. You're there stationary at this point. So maybe you'd like to weigh in. I don't know. 
Yes, I'm now uh, successfully made it made it home. So <laughs> I'll uh, I'll say a couple things before uh, you know, I'm relieving my partner of of the kids. Um, I would I just to build on one of Matt's points. I think um, we have to recognize the limits of what we can do with um, things like forecasting and and sort of that interaction between the role that risk communication, the role that forecasting can play in terms of uh, how it can influence behavior. Um, you know, you are not, regardless of, of whether you have um, an accurate forecast of one week or two weeks, you're still gonna have people that refuse to leave or refuse to evacuate or um, are, are just gonna choose to be ignorant of, of the situation. And so ultimately when it comes to risk reduction and dealing with these vulnerabilities, it's the stuff that comes before that emergency management phase that you know, we think is, is of, of vital importance. Uh, what we can do, though, which is interesting, is and Matt's team has, has got some work on this, is that they're seeing in some of the statistical models that they're looking at some of the footprints of what these floods are likely to look like, um, and in real time tracking their progress and tracking the accuracy of these models relative to what we're seeing in some of the forecasts. And that's actually quite exciting because in Canada, for the most part, when it comes to mapping and measuring hazards, we've relied on sort of a more uh, ground truth validation approach that's fine at a very local scale, but doesn't scale up to the national level where you need to use a lot more statistical prediction uh, to better assess uh, vulnerability. And so when those forecasts align with what the model has predicted, let's say in terms of a flood, that gives us a lot of confidence that that model is in fact um, sufficient enough, not perfect, but generally good enough to begin directing preparations or actions that you would need to take on the ground before you need to make a warning or a forecast about the extreme weather you know, so I'm talking here about things like ensuring people have uh, adequate and available uh, insurance um, in the most dire and, of course, high risk areas, uh, providing options for things like relocation, uh, which are going to become much more critical in the future. So uh, I, I think to go back to where I, I started this, this point, I, I think it's important to recognize uh, the limitations of the tools that we're using, in addition to what scale and what stakeholder they're appropriate for influencing the behavior of. Um, you know. I'll just say on the last one, we have a lot of research via surveys of Canadians that find that they are very poor risk managers, frankly. Um, they are unaware of most risks. Um, and that's not unlike any other jurisdiction. People are just going about their day trying to get uh, to the end of it, right? So I, I think we need to have good expectations about uh, how these tools, the, the influence of these tools and the appropriate stakeholders uh, that they're trying to influence. Thanks for that, Jason. It's interesting, you touch on a couple of things there, the, the um, idea of responsibility and how much responsibility should we be taking on to sort of solve this, these complex problems, definitely communicating, uh, generating forecasts and warnings and communicating those risks is, is important, but it's one piece of a bigger puzzle. So we have to recognize our limitations. Um, and then in terms of risk management, uh, the public, um, I would, I would, uh, based on my research, not disagree with you at all, but I also find that people are just uh, not consumed, but worried perhaps about different kinds of risks. And so uh, in my world, it's about understanding what those risks are and how do we make connections between those risks and why we need to have them act in, in response to the risks that we've identified as being threatening. Um, Okay, thank you for that, Jason uh, and everyone. Uh, Jen. Yeah, I'd love to say something about this. Uh, ask ask a follow up question because this whole um, this is really enlightening and challenging for uh, for everybody in the room. Um, and you know, Russ and Dave talked about impact based forecasting. So, in order to understand the impact, you have to understand the vulnerability as uh, both Jason and Matt talked about um, uh, understanding the risk or, or, or again, understanding the vulnerability. And I remember, of course, one of the areas that I've been quite involved with is, is on the flood side. And so a lot of discussion this week has been, or the last couple of days has been around the flooding. And I remember when the insurance industry finally said at a meeting I was at at Cat IQ, oh, we're doing now flood maps for the country, flood risk maps. And my question was, oh, 
how can I find out whether my house is at risk? Because if I know my house is at risk of a hundred millimeter rain, my basement's gonna flood. I'm gonna take action when I hear that forecast. I'm not gonna finish my basement or I'm gonna put a sump pump in or I'm gonna change the way I design my landscaping or what have you, but I need to know my risk first. And if the forecasters are gonna be um, issuing risk bait or, or uh, impact-based forecasts, they need to understand these vulnerabilities. So maybe Jason and Matt know, where are we with a kind of a national flood risk kind of a product? I mean, there's, there's flash flood risk, there's um, river flood risk, and there's coastal flood risk where I live. And where are we in understanding this risk of what's the most costly impact to the economy in Canada from a natural disaster? So maybe I can field that um, for a couple of reasons. One is the Minister of Emergency Preparedness. So my minister was issued two related mandate commitments. One of them was to develop a high risk, low cost flood insurance market in Canada, which obviously, as you alluded to, before insurers are willing to insure something, they need to know what the probabilities and what the costs look like. And that just didn't exist nationally in Canada up until even a couple of years ago. And also the minister was issued a mandate commitment from the prime minister to develop a national flood risk portal so that Canadians and municipalities could understand where their risk is across the country. So we have a report that should be published, if not at the end of June, then early July, which pulls together at a high level the results of our analysis there. And I'll give you a quick snapshot of what we've done and you know, some of the high level findings. So we worked with Natural Resources Canada to gather together from the provinces and from the federal government, all existing flood maps that we could get a hold of. So everything that was developed under the flood damage reduction program from 1970 to 1995, everything that we had funded through the National Disaster Mitigation Program, anything that was publicly available on websites and databases in different provinces and territories, and amalgamated that into a single data layer. And then on top of that, we procured the all of the publicly available private sector catastrophic loss maps. So these are the maps that the insurers have been using. So JBA, Aon, and CatRisk were the three that were available for Canada that had probabilistic models for the whole country. And that was for pluvial, fluvial, and coastal flooding. Um, so then we were able to overlay the probabilistic global models on top of the regulatory maps to get a sense of calibration of how they were performing across different types of flooding. And we were also able to procure for the residential building stock, building footprints for the entire country and building attribute information. So we knew whether there was a presence of finished basements, um, you know, what year of building code the buildings were built to and what the property values were. And then by overlaying those probabilistic maps on top of the exposure maps and using uh, damage functions, so depth damage curves basically, or damage ratios, we can figure out exactly what the annual average loss is expected to be in the model for flooding across the country, it's way higher than we thought. And what's driving that increase is actually the fat tail of the distribution. It's the events that are the one in 100 and up um, events that we haven't actually seen in many watersheds across the country. And so it looks like just for the residential building stock alone, the annual average loss is close to $3 billion a year, which is at least three times what we thought it was. Um, so that's, that's noteworthy. It's also the case that when we look at another kind of fat tail of the distribution, the individual properties at highest risk, the top 10% of properties account for 90% of the risk. So you have 175,000 properties across the country that account for 90% of the flood risk. And even the top 1% um, is about 35% of the risk. So we're able to now much more credibly target in to those specific areas that are at most risk that are driving the costs and the exposures and able to make much better informed decisions in theory moving forward. So now the question I think for governments at the federal, provincial and territorial level is how comfortable are we of the performance of these maps? And at what point are we in a position to be able to either provide a, a massively discounted access to the IPs for local governments to be able to go in and see where their flood risk is, regardless of whether or not they have regulatory maps? Or is there a point at which we're sufficiently confident in the performance of these models that we can flip a switch and just make them available to anybody to go in and type in their flood risk score? And from our perspective, we think that we're very close. So, I mean, we'll see ultimately which direction federal, provincial, and territorial governments want to go on that. But the science is, if not perfectly there now, we're on the precipice. Awesome. Thank you. 
any comments from the other panelists on the potential availability of flood risk maps? Well, I suppose I'm going to say that if if we um, it's, this is all very exciting, so um, we're finally going to be able to untap some of the useful data. I mean, we've been asking the federal government for a long time to to intervene in this way and take on this role. So the uh, after about two days learning about some of the work that Matt and his team have been working on, I, I'm, we could be on the precipice here of some of some profound changes in information across the country. Um, the one thing that that I'm particularly excited about is further engagement in the use of these this this map data uh, in these high risk communities. Um, ultimately, what we need to have happen is that that information gets mobilized, it gets disseminated, and we start to see some accountability at the community level, the provincial level, for addressing some of those risks. And knowing the location of that risk is, is actually the, the first step towards doing that. So uh, it, it's just really exciting. And I think we could be seeing, um, certainly, you know, Matt posted the emergency management plan at the in his slide at the end there. And one of the critical um, goals, objectives of that plan is to understand the risk. Uh, so it, it's uh, encouraging to see that we've got some action on that front here. And sorry, there's there's one other piece that I should just add on because I led with the social sciences view and then I forgot about it when I was talking about the modeling. And, and that is that we're also through census data and some different pretty strongly theoretically grounded um, census indicators able to pull together a social vulnerability and resilience index by using 49 socio-demographic indicators that are um, empirically predictive of post-disaster outcomes. So we also know who's in those homes, right? And where we have high degrees of exposure, both at the property level, but also at the tenant or who's occupying the homes level so that we can start to factor in not just the where the water's going, not just where the water is going and where it's impacting buildings, but also who lives in those buildings. And so we can be much more deliberate and much more equitable in the way that we try to construct our programming moving forward. Thank you, Matt. Okay, turn it back to you, Jen, sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's fine. Um, so we were able to get through Mindy's first question. Um, I want to um, cue Charles to take on his own comment there if, if uh, Charles is all right to, to, to share your comment and question. And while Charles is queuing up for that, um, I wanna remind everyone that Julianne posted something in the chat about a book one of my colleagues, uh, Phaedra Daifa, I, I, I believe that's her name, Masters of Uncertainty, Weather Forecasters and the Quest for Ground Truth. So Julianne included the link here to uh, University of Chicago uh, where the, where the uh, book can be found or where more information can be found. So um, Phaedra went into different, um, uh, into different uh, forecast offices and sat with meteorologists, observed their work practices and tried to get a sense for how they manage uncertainty um, when they're trying to forecast different um, atmospheric events. So Charles, what do you think? Are you all set up to share your comment? Uh, uh, sure, uh, yeah, it seems to be uh, remarkably well-placed between Mindy's comments and mentions Mindy, so it's kind of fun. Um, I, I'm just, uh, it's a bit of a, it's a nod towards the work that Mindy and her collaborators have done on this uh, atmospheric river rating scale um, that, that I think is quite, quite good and promising. And uh, I'm just uh, trying to, to, and I'm sure they already have this in mind, but make a plea that uh, more work could be done in this in a kind of offline mode, certainly not used for forecasts or warnings yet, but um, some systematic work about seeing how well um, a given atmospheric river uh, scaled event, uh, you know, an actual number correlates to the precipitation that falls in that event in a given area. Um, following it up with the assessment of damages, um, both you know economic and human damages, uh, and and doing this for all of the the West Coast events that that happen for us every fall and winter, so that we can build up a bit of a, a database and some understanding of of whether such a, a system, a simplistic scale, could be useful or not. Um, and then I just. Uh, you know, threw it out there to to one of your panelists to see whether um, you know, particularly some of the challenges that Dave Campbell mentioned at the River Forecast Center, whether something like this would be helpful or whether it's um, 
you know, kind of a, a, another kettle of fish in terms of simplifying uh, everything too much and, and maybe uh, stick, sticking the neck out of forecasters a little too much. That was great, Charles, and thank you. I certainly couldn't have done the comment uh, as much justice, so I appreciate you um, being willing to share your comment and question. Dave, um, do you have some a response possibly for Charles? Um, could work along these lines help with some of the challenges faced by BCRFC um, that you mentioned? Yeah, no, I think it's a, a great comment. and. Uh... I think it does touch on a number of the themes that have been bouncing around in this discussion today. Um, you know, first of all, as sort of a, a tool for communication, and I think that's one of those um, strengths of, of looking at something like a, an atmospheric river scale system, where uh, some of the nuances that, that might be within the forecast community can be presented to the public uh, in, a, in a more simplified way that is easier to understand. We're not necessarily talking about you know, 100 millimeters of rainfall or a one in 20 year event or, or language like that. We, we are, you know, presenting something more on a kind of gradation scale um, that can help support that. The other tie in I think comes in with uh, discussions we've been having around that impact based um, uh, forecasting. And that's where, uh, and obviously I know Mindy's on the, on the chat here as well uh, and, and leading the effort on, on this work. Um, we've been working together with uh, in Environment Canada and Climate Change Canada on some of those impact-based analysis and, and very much in line with um, Charles's comments to try to start to develop a database that we can look to for um, historic atmospheric rivers that have, have occurred and tying that in with that impact-based uh, um, um, impact side that we've seen. So both uh, rainfall intensities, rainfall, and resulting river responses. And so that is a piece of ongoing research that we're trying to do and really trying to connect um, the um, forecasts that are coming out and, and sort of bundling it into that in, uh, atmospheric river scale um, side of things uh, and then have that sort of database to be able to work from on the impact side. So that's, that's, that's a piece of ongoing work that we're doing. Um, the last thing I'd maybe, um, comment on is, um, you know, it, it really is a, a way of sort of bundling information that is there. So I, I see that as really the strength as well. We're not, it's not necessarily um, new information or, or forecast information that's not coming out of current forecast, but it's, it's a way that we can um, systematically break it down. It doesn't mean it's more bundled into that, um, you know, scale. So we're still, you know, getting similar information out in terms of, or, or challenges associated with things like uncertainty are, are still present in that we're, we're, we're bundling up precipitation forecasts which are existing um, so really I think the strength in it is 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 in having that um, that kind of more overarching um, scale level that can be more easily interpreted uh, and then yeah I, I think the sort of it's it's the the work in progress to, to be able to tie that into the, the more impact-based side Okay, thank you, Dave. Mindy, could you, uh, could you could comment there? Uh, oh, yes, yeah, please do. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm just happy to say that you know Mindy's Mindy's work is is be, is being looked at both from you know the, the the scientific viability, the the operational aspects of that, but also from the from the services aspects. And I think you know that's what that's what what Dave is referring to here is this is this does this help us from a sort of a communication perspective? But I think one of the things that's that's really interesting about Mindy's approach. You know, when we talk about these scales and we think, for example, about the hurricane scale, which allows you to communicate to staff that, you know, here's staff, sorry, the public, here's this, here's this storm coming up the East Coast, and this is this is the intensity. There's this, this simplistic means of, of communicating the intensity and you associate the risks with the intensity. I think I think what Mindy's doing is interesting in the sense that we we think about impact-based forecasting sometimes as going outside of the organization and bringing this information in so when this particular meteorological event took place what were the were the external impacts but I, but I think this approach that's being taken by that group is mining our internal capabilities is using our modeling capabilities that are coming online as we as we, these coupled models emerge as hydrologic hydrologic predictive capability emerges it allows us to use the, the internal system to try and get some kind of an idea with this kind of system arriving, what are the impacts in a distributed hydrometeorological sense across the landscape? 
which provides more guidance for forecasters, more, more guidance for, for days group. So I, I think it's there's there's a layer of complexity beyond just the sort of a communication scale, but that is actively being looked at. Thanks for that, Russ. You, uh, you offered a, an essential connection point there, I think, um, cleared some things up for me at least. Um, Okay, now I was going to ask if uh, Mindy had a response to the comments that Dave and Russ offered or if Charles wanted to follow up just to, to circle um, fully uh, on this one question and then we would move on if, if uh, Mindy, Charles or no one else had anything to add to this particular point. Anyone? Um, I just, I don't really have anything much to add other than to thank everybody for all their efforts. Uh, we're trying to listen closely to what the managers want and what others need. And it's uh, it's not just me, it's the whole team of people. And uh, it's people that came up to us initially and said, we need an ass assessment of the worst storm expected. So we always keep that. The scale is really to help us separate out what is the worst storm expected. And we never want to lose that perspective, but... Um, Anyway, it isn't just me. There are a lot of people trying and all the comments are terrific. Uh, yeah. But you, you see my other comment there was about FEMA. I know people in FEMA and they said um, what they wanted us to do is give them a forecast out two weeks in advance and they don't care if they have low confidence because they need to put materials and people in places to be ready. So they're a different type of user that and I uh, just wondering whether there are any comments about about that. Yeah, thank you for that, Mindy. I was going to uh, shift over to this second question. I know uh, we discussed with panelists, Jim and I, different questions that um, that we have uh, curiosity for for answers and responses to. But uh, before we shift into those, I would like for us to um, to think more and maybe have a bit more of a conversation about Mindy's second question here. Uh, and it centers on confidence, really. And I know I'm doing some work with, um, with some others in the room here on the, this aspect or element of confidence in terms of warning and communication. But Mindy asks, how long in advance and with what confidence is an extreme event forecast needed? Um, and Mindy commented on the different needs that user groups or stakeholders have when it comes to confidence. Uh, FEMA seems to not need a high degree of confidence in order to position their people. Um, I, I would assume that the public might want a higher degree of confidence. Um, so what do our panelists think? How long in advance and with what confidence is an extreme event forecast needed? Okay, maybe I'll take a stab at, at that one for you. Uh, and with the highly scientific answer, well, it depends. So, you know, I think if we look at uh, look at some of these events, uh, and not just the events in BC, you know, with other events, and if you if you look at the impacts and say, well, you know, how could some of those impacts have uh, have been mitigated? And I think you sort of have to look at the you know the very immediate decisions, or look at it in terms of what are the decisions that were taken. So certainly in, in the case of the BC floods, um, there were fatalities. There were fatalities because people were driving on the roads on the footsteps of extremely steep slopes with high antecedent moisture and high forecast precipitation. So one would hope that that's the kind of thing that we could get across, that under these circumstances, there is, a, there is a risk. Now we don't forecast landslides, but we can forecast conditions where those would be a risk and the public authorities could communicate that. So, you know, what's the timeline to have that confidence? That's very much a, a short fuse kind of, kind of forecast. If you look at some of the other impacts, say, for example, the, um, the impacts on livestock. So in the Sumas Prairie area, there was really significant impacts on the agricultural activities, chickens, <laughs> cows, these things that can be moved. How much lead time would have been required to indicate that the you know the infrastructure that maintains the Sumas Prairie was 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 under threat, and how much lead time would they need to actually have moved those animals? And and I can't answer that, but I think it's the the process of of looking at 
what is the decision and what is the time scale of the decision? Some of the points that, you know, that, that Matt is making um, surrounding decisions about really that concern municipal planning and how we, you know, how we put up um, the buildings in the floodplain and how we control zoning in the floodplain, that's on a completely different time scale. So I think the part of the, the pathway is to look about the decisions that are made, what time scale those decisions are made in, and what kind of what, what kind of lead time they need. I don't think there is kind of a one answer fits all, and there's quite likely different levels of confidence for those different kinds of uh, those different kinds of situations. Yeah, excellent points. That a one size fits all approach won't be uh, entirely useful, um, but meeting the needs of so many diverse groups is extremely difficult as well. Jim, you had some comments and I, I don't want to dismiss them. Um, you, you are referencing uh, Nathan's comment and I just wanna give you an opportunity to weigh in here if, if this question is actually related to what Nathan brought up. Yeah, well, actually I was just reading Nathan's comment while Russ was talking and I mean, Nathan was asking a question about uh, basically, uh, even a better uh, or a longer perfect forecast may not have changed things and some things, most of those being the economic losses because of where we build and where the farms are located and, and et cetera. But some of the, the points that Russ made are excellent points. When it comes to people's lives in the short term, then certainly as much warning as possible for somebody not to travel because of the heavy rain and the potential impact on the highways. Um, and so I was kind of articulating um, in the back room that um, something that came up in a pre-meeting we had and Russ um, and, and Jason were chatting about the forecast accuracy and and likelihood and the stuff we're talking about now. And Jason made the point that even a perfect forecast wouldn't change a lot of our flooding impacts in this country because of where people le live. And, and uh, uh, I don't know how many people read a Global Mail article from something that came out of Western University this week. And I don't know if you saw it, uh, um, Jen, but Basically, the University of Western Ontario showed that more than 30 communities across Canada have at least one tenth of their buildings within a floodplain. Those are river floodplains with Chilliwack, 46.5%. Um, and a lot of them are in New Brunswick and British Columbia and Ontario. Even Yellowknife has 16% of their buildings within a floodplain. It goes into the point that, that Matt was making is is, is that there's a lot of stock, residential and, and commercial stock that's in a floodplain. They may or may not even know it, but the challenge, and I think Jason mentioned that, is this is the municipal tax base is, is these properties and some of the most vulnerable properties, like in a coastal zone in Nova Scotia, are the most valuable properties. And, and, and so I kind of just rambling about what Nathan pointed out and rather than turn it over to Dave about a perfect flood forecast, I thought that it's worth mentioning that a lot of the discussion has been capturing the essence of what Nathan has, has mentioned. So thanks for sharing. Thanks for turning that over to me, Jen. Yeah, no problem. I am. Um... I just didn't want to dismiss your messages because uh, you were you were sending them and I thought, oh, geez, I, I, I just wanted to make sure I addressed them. Right. And so Nathan's comment uh, for everyone um, sent it's in the chat at 4 p.m. to follow up on Jason and Jennifer's points. Uh, he, they were asking the panel uh, if the panels panelists have views on how much damages from the BC heat wave and BC floods might have been mitigated with even better or longer lead time weather forecasts. Um, there are limits to the potential for short-term responses uh, and limits uh, to, um, sorry, some of the response measures are longer term climate adaptation actions, uh, which Nathan considers to be things like stronger bridges to withstand floods 
or building design improvements to better deal with heat waves. So I just wanted to make that clear uh, what Jim was referring to. That's That was Nathan's comment in the chat. I see, I see Matt has his hand raised. Oh, sure, Matt, go ahead. I just wanted to build on Russ's like it depends perspective and maybe just add an additional layer on top of that. So, you know, my general, the general resilience view that I ascribe to is like most of the economic losses, the lead time you need is 25 years, right? Like you're talking about the development decisions, right? So let's, let's park those and agree that for, for that, you know, no conceivable forecast that we're going to get in the next 50 years is going to have a big impact on that. But when you're looking at life safety, one of the variables is that confidence um, question. So mm -hmm. for example, under the emergency management strategy, we invest quite a bit in seismic sensors to buy like 30 seconds worth of time, right? When you get a West Coast seismic scenario, you can get the information that that earthquake is coming with not a lot of lead time, but with 100% certainty that it's coming in the case of a mega thrust event. And with that 30 seconds, you can do some amazing things like shut off natural gas, flow valves, automatically raise the doors in first response centers and fire stations and police stations, because when the power goes out, it actually becomes problematic for them to be able to get out. So like there are good things that we can do with even a very short time horizon when you have a lot of certainty that what's coming is, is going to be what's happening. But the other part that I think is also interesting is the pairing of the behaviors of the community and the framing of the event with the community. So if you think about how much time it takes to do something like evacuate a school building with the first fire drill of the year versus the second versus the third versus the fourth, it gets much more efficient, right? And so the lead time for a community who knows how to respond appropriately to um, whether it's the, the atmospheric river levels or storm levels or anything else, that can help you to deal with not having that same amount of lead time because the community knows exactly what to do in response to that information. So I think that there's a, a push and pull there between the time horizon and the way in which the message is received and acted upon within the community. Um, and I think that's often overlooked, like that interplay between having an informed populace that knows what to do versus uh, one who, for whom maybe it, it just doesn't mean quite so much. Um, so yeah, I just think that that's another element that, that we could help to make up for the fact that we don't have perfect forecasts and perfect lead times. And just the last thing I would say on that is with the right framing in a population, predicting an event that doesn't happen is you exercising the system and is a positive. What we normally get is when there's a prediction for something severe that doesn't happen, everyone says, well, of course, like this is, this system's broken. P these people don't know what they're talking about. But that also is just a question of narrative and of the receiving population more than it is the fact that you predicted something that didn't actually happen the way that you thought it might. Yeah, those are important points as well, Matt. Thanks for adding those. Um the idea that um, a false alarm essentially is still a good test and good practice for a system and uh, helps to build efficiencies and, and create perhaps um, yeah, more efficient response. That is, that's, a, that's an important dimension. I also wonder though about the potential consequences that those false alarms have on people's willingness to go along with um, the the requests made uh, in the future when when hazards come up. I really like the what you shared with us about the seismic sensors, and I didn't realize that we have that in place. But how fascinating that there's that certainty that that we can have. Um, it might only give us 30 seconds, you said, but a lot can be done in those 30 seconds. That's, that's phenomenal. I didn't know about that. Um, does anyone have anything to add uh, following Matt's comments? want to give the panelists all an, an opportunity to speak. And of course, anyone in the room, we still have 84 people here, which is about four times more than I have in my classes, I have to say. <laughs> so this is a full house, according to me. <laughs> no? Okay. Uh, oh, hi. Uh, hi. And, uh, and Jen, I just wondered if I could just make a quick comment to follow up Absolutely. on the, what I yeah. typed uh, in the chat. And um, yes, it's been really interesting to hear this discussion. Um, so my perspective is in um, kind of climate change. So I think about adaptation to climate change. But and it's obviously the, the panelists have thought about this already. But obviously, there's a there's a um, a clear relationship between um, 
you know, adaptation to long-term changes in climate change and, um, you know, uh, forecasting and uh, impact um, forecasting and the kind of the short-term disaster response uh, or planning, um, responding to forecasts uh, to reduce the impacts of a disaster. Um, and yeah, so I was really just just thinking that there are there are obviously clear kind of synergies between those two things. Um, and I liked um, Max, uh, Matt's example of the school fire drill practice. So if you know a certain type of extreme is going to become um, more frequent with climate change, then you can you can kind of practice for it and then make better use of the um, of the the warning information that you get from forecasts. So yeah, I was just going to say again that I thought that um, and maybe others have more um, comments on this, but the the, the synergies between um, kind of climate change adaptation and and forecasting and communication and response on shorter timescales are, are interesting and important, I think. Thanks. Thank you for that, Nathan. Appreciate you speaking up and sharing your perspective there. Um, does anyone have anything to add to what Nathan shared? And if not, we might continue on in the chat. There are some additional um, comments that are worth highlighting here. Um, one made by Vanessa uh, Ford talking, uh, just agreeing with Mindy, really this was sent at 3.33 that the heat dome temps were well forecasted, but they were so out of range of normal that uh, folks didn't believe it or maybe didn't even know how to respond. Oh, hi, Lisa, I see you popping up here on my screen. Um, and Vanessa uh, encourages more collaboration, just highlighting the importance of collaboration across different stakeholders, whether that's meteorologists or different climate change experts. Uh, that's definitely something I believe in as well, Vanessa. Um, then also Serge Desjardins uh, added that the message has to be built as an evolving story where we are not shy to talk about the uncertainties in the forecast because we fear people will interpret it as we do not know. And like Russ was saying at the time, no, I'm not saying now, um, conveying the information of the extremities of the scenarios, um, I think the, the point was that that's important. Um, and this actually relates to something that um, M, uh, no, Ruth was suggesting. Ruth Digby um, wondered, this was just a few minutes ago, if communicating uncertainty and extreme forecasts would actually increase public confidence. Um, I might be in that camp, actually. Um, and Ruth continues to say, if forecasting extreme events don't come through, there isn't the same developing opinion that forecasters always exaggerate. Yeah, if we, if we kind of communicate our, our uncertainty, our, that we don't exactly know what's happening, perhaps that would be, that would be better. She indicates this partly goes back to Jason's comments on people sometimes just not wanting to leave that I think that's pointing to the people aren't good risk managers, essentially. And from Ruth's experience growing up in a pretty rural area where fo folks are very resistant to evacuation orders, um, I think Ruth is trying to, uh, you know, confirm what Jason was saying. Um, okay, so that just... Uh, I think rounds out the comments in the uh, chat. Jim, I don't know if we wanna take it over to you for the last few minutes. I think we have 12 minutes left in the session. If you wanted to lead the final questions, I know we had discussed some with the panelists prior to joining here uh, together today as a group. Well, one of the things I'd like the panel to think about is how do we incentivize uh, behavior change? So. We're talking, I mean, that last comment that Ruth made about folks don't want to evacuate or they don't want to obviously, um, cities don't want to change their planning context. And, and of course these things cost money. So, um, and evacuation costs money and is it convenient? So what is it that we need to do to, change behavior or incentivize behavior. And I'd welcome any thoughts from the panelists on that. 
Yeah, that's a tough one. I'm glad that the panelists are the experts that are in charge of answering <laughs> this question. So I'm not sure if uh, which of our panelists would like to take it away. We've got Russ, Dave, Matt, and Jason all here still to, to um, give us their perspectives. I suppose my perspective to, to begin, and Matt may have some, um, some additional points on this from, from, I know his team is working on some of these behavioral issues. Is from our survey data, we just know that there's recognition, there's there's limits on the amount of behavior you can get someone to change, um, and it, it isn't much. So in my mind, um, you know, so one of the big principles of the course of, of risk management is that when we take data on the weather or hazards and we translate it into a risk, that it becomes this economic signal that then people will collectively respond to rationally and take actions to, to reduce their risk. Well, if we've learned one thing from COVID, it's that we're not very good at this. We're not very good at understanding and assessing our risk and in particular our own um, risk at an individual level. And it's in these situations where, to Jim's point about, well, how do we encourage change? Sometimes you're gonna have to use a hammer. Sometimes you're gonna have to, um, for local governments, you know, pull resources or, uh, so for a, a practical example would be like this. One thing we like to do in Canada when it comes to disaster assistance in the aftermath of a, of a recovery is we like to say, yes, you qualify for disaster assistance after you've had the flood, but you have to rebuild in the exact same way as your property existed before the flood in the exact same spot, right? I mean, that is just burying your head in the sand um, about the risk, right? Historically, there were provisions within federal legislation that said, if you built in a high-risk area, you will not be eligible for disaster assistance. But the political pull to rush into a community, offer that assistance, say we're going to make you whole again, is just so strong. Um, but we can't we can't uh, give in to, to those sort of short temporal politics. We need to be better and fairer about how we're using information. We need to warn people. Uh, we need to tell communities um, beforehand, hey, you're engaging in risky development here. People coming to your council can see this data that it's risky. In addition to that, we know that insurance premiums are likely going to be made higher in this community. And as a result of that, the government isn't necessarily going to be there to backstop you in the event that you want to make a decision uh, to go ahead and, and develop. So um, I think we have to recognize sort of that there's a balance between how much we can change people's behavior um, using incentives and, and and more so towards the, I think, some of the more aggressive stuff that uh, we actually need to start thinking about just because the urgency of these issues isn't going away. We're gonna have to start using some of these more blunt regulatory command and control, uh, you know, hammer-like, stick-like tools to, to encourage some of the change that we need in this country. I'll, I'll leave it there. Thanks, Jason. I also like that every time we pan over to you, you you're different in some way. So now we, we <laughs> just, you're keeping things very exciting for our discussion today. Um, do uh, Russ, Dave or Matt have any comments to add to Jason's response? Sure, I can maybe take a stab at that. Uh, it's, it, you know, for me, coming from sort of the physical science perspective, it's, it's, it's fascinating to hear that, that social science insight into these kinds of issues. And I, I think it definitely highlights that we need to, uh, we need to sort of bridge these, you know, academic disciplines and approaches. We need to have a much closer alignment of physical science and social science. I'm in the business essentially, as I said earlier, of risk communication. Well, you can argue that that is a social science, yet we're approaching it from a physical science perspective. So, you know, I, I think in terms of, of, of how we, you know, how we approach these across those disciplines is, is really important. It's interesting to hear Matt talk about, you know, people's behavior. I, I noticed there was a, a, a comment from the Matthias in the chat there about um, you know what is what is the need for some of these clients who are looking for information about what you know when do they close down the pipeline when do they close down the, the highway so this notion of individual behavior versus institutional behavior uh, and how we access those things and, and hearing these comments broadly um, it, it's almost like we are in a, we are in a situation where we're actually trying to sort of retrofit society to respond to you know, a new a new forcing in terms of these climate events. And I, I think it's interesting to see, understand who's, who's gonna bear the costs and who's gonna actually have to take the actions and where are the perceptions that drive those behaviors? 
there was some interesting stories that came out about impacts and about people's understanding of impacts during the, the heat dome. I, I know we sort of we focus on Vancouver and the lower mainland, but that was an event that propagated across Western Canada. And I remember there being a report from a, a restaurant owner somewhere on the prairies, can't remember where it was, that the, the increase in cost of wheat was impacting his restaurant business. So there's this notion of, of understanding more broadly um, what the impacts of change are. I, I think we're only really learning about what the impacts can be. So that notion of supporting those behaviors on the individual level, but also those institutional, those institutional decisions and how we support those. You know, who's gonna take that decision to shut down the road, which is in some ways what Matthias is referring to, and what's the confidence that, that they'd have to have in order to make that type of a decision. That's exactly what we're trying to get to. And we've, we had examples during the atmospheric river event on the, the second or third wave, where we actually sat down with them and said, this is what we think is coming. And the road was closed proactively. Well, I think what Matthias is pointing to is that the consequences of those kinds of decisions. So build, building in the elements so we have an understanding of what is required to support those decisions for institutions, uh, I think is really important. And again, this, this link between physical and social science is something I think we all have some responsibility for. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more, Russ. Understanding the decisions, understanding the decision behaviors. Um, Jay, uh, Jason pointed out these economic signals. Uh, you talked about the different needs of stakeholders. I, I might actually introduce the idea of more socially based signals, perhaps different, different groups are not reducing decisions to an economic data point, but rather might be families who are making decisions uh, based on needs of their family members or more, more socially based decisions. Um, with that said, though, I'd like to offer Dave and Matt an opportunity to respond. And then I think I'll, I'll then bring it back to Jim to close up the session. Yeah, I would maybe just have a couple of quick quick comments. And I, I think, yeah, there's sort of the, this linkage between an identification of a hazard that we know is here. We know that there's there's vulnerabilities um, and, and the aspect of understanding uh, the, the, that element of, of risk. And then there's the this hazard that we've identified, it's happening, it's in the forecast, we might see it coming and trying to kind of link those two concepts um, in, in terms of, of how individuals and societies um, kind of reflect on, on the exposure that, that we do have. Um, I might leg back to the discussion that, you know, kind of the, the forecast I put out in the, in the beginning and, and going, are we, are we prepared to, um, we, we know that you're at risk in the floodplain, are you ready to have six warnings a year that you might need to pack up and move move the cows, move the chickens, and how much time do you need for that? Um, or you, do you realize that this, this might only happen once every 10 years, but you're gonna get that warning five or six times a year that it, it could be this weekend that it's happening. So I think there's gonna be just kind of linking that um, awareness and understanding of the, the hazards and vulnerability that are there and that that is going to be, you know, kind of that key factor for um, how, you know, what what's our tolerance level. And I, I think those are interesting uh, areas for inquiry in the future to, to really start to, you know, maybe look at these in more uh, of an economic perspective, cost benefit analysis, and, and weighing out the costs associated with false alarms, uh, whether that be economic terms or also that there's a social costs that go along with with over over forecasting or, or over warning. So I'll, I'll maybe stop with that and uh, yeah. okay thanks Dave um Jim do we have time if Matt, uh, yeah. Matt wants to follow up okay yeah. just give you an opportunity Matt the only thing that I would say is I mean one of the things that we know from disaster sociological theory is you want to get those decisions made well in advance of the occurrence of the event so you want to set parametric triggers like hey when the forecast is this much rain this highway just gets closed automatically and then there's no longer the politician or the emergency manager who made that decision that people hold them accountable for. So pre-negotiating those important decisions well in advance gets us out of the problem of giving somebody for the public to blame. And it just becomes like, okay, that's just part of, that's the way that the system works. And all of a sudden you're making much more rational decisions. And we've seen great examples of that kind of risk tolerance setting well in advance in communities like the District of North Vancouver. Um, and so there's lots of great case studies there. They got the United Nations uh, Resilience Award in 2011. So you can all go see what they've done if you're so interested, but certainly trying to 
create those parametric triggers and, and get as much of the decision making pre thought through and pre negotiated well in advance, I think is always to our benefit. And just totally to reinforce uh, Russ's point, I think this intersection between the natural sciences and the social sciences, it's been a long time coming. And I would argue that the social sciences in the disaster emergency management domain are finally at a sufficient level of maturity that we may have something to contribute to the conversation on things like social vulnerability, on things like uh, risk communication and, and probably a number of others. So I, I totally agree. Like, I think we need to take it upon ourselves to continue to help foster those linkages. Yeah, great follow up there, Matt, especially to Russ's point. And, and I'll, I'll close it by um, also sharing what Colin shared in the chat, which was that they appreciate the pragmatic realism that Dave offered. And essentially we can't forecast our way out of inappropriate development. I think that um, points to other comments that were made regarding responsibility and the roles of different groups in terms of helping to solve these complex problems. Um, so Jim, I will uh, give the floor back to you and um, you, well, thank you. Yeah, close thank off you. our session, I suppose. Yes, well, thank you very much, Jen. And thank you, Chris, for navigating the uh, mechanics of the Zoom call. Uh, there are another number of, of uh, comments. Trevor had a nice comment and Armel. Everybody knows Armel because of the work he did. Um, and he was a TV star last year, of course. Um, and uh, I'd like to thank everybody in the audience. This was really an engaging conversation. And, you can see that the conversation is still is still happening. But finally, we've got four busy people, Matt, Russ, Dave, and Jason, that back to the theme of the Congress, Science Serving Society. These four busy people agreed to come and share their thoughts on this important topic because it's important, as I said. And really the, the message I got around science serving society is really around enabling effective decision-making in the face of uncertainty. And the society benefit is to save lives and to protect property. And we, we saw a really nice divergence of the, and convergence of the conversation between adaptation, disaster mitigation, and extreme weather forecasting. And the bottom line I heard at the very a number of times is where Jason uh, and and uh, Matt talked about ah we're working together insurance and academia and government are working together to deal with this challenge and Dave and Russ who actually knew each other I understand went to school said yes we work together. BC Forecast Center and the Environment Canada, and we work together on some of the stuff that Mindy's doing. And ultimately, you see the kind of collaboration we have just in these four panelists and amongst all of the CMOS uh, crowd to essentially enable science to serve society. And I want to thank everybody, and I'll close the, uh, uh, the session with that. <laughs>